introduce Pastor Stephen Broden. I really feel kind of awkward introducing Pastor Broden because I know that he has spoken to us several times before, and many of you know him uh, probably better than I do. Uh, Pastor Broden is the founder of the Fair Park Bible Fellowship, a, a non-denominational non church in Dallas. He served as the senior pastor of that church since 1987, which makes me think they hired him or he founded the church when he was a teenager. Because he was a little old enough. I wish the man would look, you know, look his age to make me feel better. He has organized the Constitutional Defenders of Texas to call attention to elected officials who ignore their pledge to support and defend. Pastor Broden, would you take the mic, please, and the floor is yours. Hello, fellow patriots. It is good to be with you this evening and to be a part of uh, your vetting process to uh, experience that and listen to some of the candidates and those who represent the candidates uh, express why it is they want to serve our interests. Amen? And it's good. We want to know what they know and if in fact they are consistent with what we know to be true about who we are as a people, especially as Americans underneath the guidance of the Constitution. Um, uh, today is my birthday. And I'm 61 years old, and I planted the Fair Park Bible Fellowship Church back in 1987. So, um, you're kind to say I look young. You're very, very kind. My kids would say, Daddy, you're old. <laughs> now, I have a lot to say to you this evening. I don't know what my time schedule is like, but I looked at the program, and it says that you're out of here at 8.30. Right. But when I begin, and, and you feel like, let that guy go, just let the organizers know we want him to stay a little bit longer. <laughs> and, and as a preacher, I can go for, uh, you know, about 45 to an hour, you know, with no problem. I mean, just, just in my introduction, I can go that long. <laughs> Amen. But it, it's good to be here because I think uh, we are living in a, in a strange and unusual moment in our nation's history. We are witnessing some changes and some transformations that are absolutely out of sync with what we know to be true about who we are as a people and what our government should be all about. Uh, we're living in a time when everything that is good is now considered evil and everything that is evil is now considered good. Whether you know that or not, that's where we are. Amen. And we're witnessing that for many of us who are sitting here, it is absolutely uncomfortable for us, but we don't know what to do about it. Uh, we know that it's not right. It's inconsistent with the values that we know and have been exposed to in this country. And yet still we see our leadership in Washington, D.C. promoting and fostering an ideological difference from anything that we have known or are accustomed to in America today. And uh, for uh, I just want to share a couple of these things with you to frame for you why it is that we started the Constitutional Defenders of Texas. Uh, the Constitutional Def Defenders of Texas is the direct result of what I'm about to frame for you right now that represents the fundamental change that is being foisted upon us by the cultural Marxists who are running our government today. Now, that's a bold statement for me to say. But what you are uncomfortable about and why you are uneasy about what's happening in Washington, D.C. is not because of uh, those who are there are representing our value systems and, and somehow there's a mix-up, but rather there is a deliberate attempt on the part of the cultural Marxists in America today to change America from who we are into something that is the antithesis of what the Founding Fathers intended for this nation. Amen. 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 If you say amen, I'll get fired up. <laughs> I'll get fired up. Uh, let me share just a couple of quotes with you that will help you to see this. You know, 
often when I go out to speak, I say that there are a number of isms that are impacting our country right now. Socialism, communism, Marxism, human secularism, and yes, men and women, Darwinism. All those isms are anti-God systems created by men who are God haters. And our country right now is embracing those ideas. And they are in control of our nation. Why is that important? Because you and I know that this country was founded upon Judeo-Christian ethics. You may be sitting here and an atheist. That doesn't alter or change the fact that the founding fathers ascribed to and appeal to the scriptures to pull out from their principles that are inculcated inside of the Declaration of Independence and inside the Constitution. May I say to you, for those of you who don't know, that over a third of the Constitution has its origin in the book of Leviticus. There's no doubt about it. But let me just share with you uh, uh, just one idea that, uh, that John Adams says. For those of you who are sitting there saying, well, Pastor Broden, you know, your politics need to be over here and Christianity needs and, and your religion needs to be over there. That's not at all what the founding fathers intended. And that's not at all what God has called us to do. Those of you who are Bible-believing Christians who understand that the directive that God has given to you is that you should be salt and light agents of the kingdom of God representing the prophetic voice where? In the public square. Because it is in the public square where ideas are birthed and ideas are embraced and we need to be there to influence those ideas before they go all the way left as they are today because we by PC, political correctness, have removed ourselves from the public square. And we have capitulated to PC when we have been called to be BC, biblically correct. <laughs> Undergirded by CC, constitutional correct. <laughs> but somehow we've allowed PC to trump BC and, PC and CC and we are finding ourselves muted by PC where we're not speaking because we're more concerned about being politically correct as opposed to being biblically correct. Well, that's not the case with this preacher here. I'm concerned about doing it God's way. And so should you. John Adams said it this way, quote, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other, unquote. That's what John Adams said. He was one of our presidents. And here's what he said. He said, this constitution that governs our land only works for a moral and religious people. And so as we begin to embrace human secularism and kick Judeo-Christian ethics and heritage underneath the bus, the constitution is rendered null and void if John Adams is correct. How many of you agree with John Adams? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of the decadence and moral decadence that we are witnessing in our culture today is because we have released the moral directives of the scriptures and embraced secular humanism, which nullifies the Constitution. And, which is, and, and as we nullify the Constitution, and that means our morality is no longer governed by those principles, and so we can get something like Enron, hello, where men who are greedy will steal and rip off people's 401ks and their retirement funds and have no compulsion, no nothing, just take the money and big deal. So what, you don't have anything. The philosophy of, of and this was given to me by a, a, a wealthy man who said this to me, he said, Pastor Broden, there's two types of people in the world. There's butt kickers and then there's those who get their butt kicked. And I happen to be a butt kicker. <laughs> That's not governed by morality or Christianity. That's greed and self selfism. So I agree with John Adams. That the Constitution was only made for immoral and religious people. It will not work otherwise. It will not work. 
Why is that important? Because we who are in the Tea Party, and I represent the Tea Party, I've been in the Tea Party right at its inception. I was right there when they started talking about tax enough already. I came into the Tea Party saying it's not just about the economy, guys. It's also about these social issues. Because God cannot bless us to be wealthy and prosperous if, in fact, we're killing our babies. Since Roe v. Wade, over 55 million babies have been killed. There are five social issues that are on the table that I've been pushing our Tea Party leadership to embrace and not run away from. Those five issues will ultimately determine who we are as a people. Abortion, euthanasia, embryonic stem cell research, human cloning, and the redefinition of marriage. All five of those issues are influencing and changing America because there are people who are embracing those ideas through the contradiction of our morality and of our sense of justice, fairness, and righteousness. And until we get that fixed, how dare us ask God to bless America when the blood of 55 million babies are being, are crying out to him right now. So this is an unusual and awkward moment for our nation. We need to recognize what it is. Now, I, I just want you to know that it's not either or. It is not just the social issues. It's not just the economic issues. It's the both of them together. And we must champion the cause in the public square. <clears throat> you and I must become the prophetic voice in the marketplace. And as you know, as this election cycle went by, most in the Republican Party and in the Tea Party said, don't mention anything about those social issues because we don't want to alienate people. <clears throat> and by not wanting to alienate people, they alienated their base. And the base didn't show up. It is the social issue. It, the, these spiritual issues are absolutely essential, men and women. Why? Because these isms that we're embracing those isms came up as a result of men saying we do not want God involved in our lives. And so they created an ideology that left him out. You remember what Karl Marx said. Karl Marx says, he said, my objective in life is to dethrone God and to destroy capitalism. Hello? What do you think is happening in America right now? God is being dethroned? And capitalism is being slowly destroyed. Am I right about it? Amen. All right. I, I come from the, the black culture. We have a call and response kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> the pastor calls and they respond. Amen. 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 Now listen to me. I, I, I want you to know that that's precisely what's happening right now, men and women. There is this thing called the Hegelian dialectic. How many of you heard of that? The Hegelian dialectic is where they create the problem fester the problem and then they bring a solution to it. Do you think it's an accident for four years we don't have a budget? I submit to you that's the Hegelian dialectic being perpetrated on America today. Do you think it's un that it's unusual or, or a political uh, back and forth that's going on between the president and the Republicans when they cannot come up with uh, a means to, to deal with this debt? I submit to you it's the Hegelian dialectic at work. Are you hearing me? Yes. A Marxist paradigm is being orchestrated deliberately on the American people, and we're not paying attention to the, the fact that these things are happening deliberately in order to destroy us. The EPA is slowly killing business, innovation, and creativity in America and regulating them right out of the marketplace. You think that's an accident? No, that's deliberate. And it's a socialistic plot that is being perpetrated on us, and we don't know what it is. And we just think it's the Republicans versus the Democrats. No, it is not. It is the cultural Marxists who have infiltrated every institution in America. Government, <coughs> academia, the family, and yes, men and women, the church are all been socialized and been beaten and bludgeoned into believing political correctness, which is an instrument that was created by the Marxists in order to destroy America. Amen. 
And every time we play PC, we play right into their hands. Are you listening to me? Yes. I'm telling you why I created the Constitution of the of Texas. Next thing I want you to hear is what Joseph Stalin said. Joseph Stalin said this, America is like a healthy body. And its resistance is threefold. It's patriotism, it's morality, and it's spiritual life. If we can undermine these three areas, America will collapse from within. Amen. Am I the only one hearing the sounds of collapse? <laughs> right now, they call those of us who are patriots lunatics. We're out on the lunatic fringe that we're listening to old men with powdered wigs. And we don't understand that we live in a contemporary society that does not necessarily comport to or bring itself under the authority of that age-old document called the Constitution. Patriotism is scoffed at. Morality has changed in America. Once that which was wrong is now right. Perversion is accepted as a normal lifestyle. And our children are being confused as to what God created, the marriage institution. He created that. Amen. We didn't create that. He has a right to define what it is. A man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave unto his wife. That's God's first directive for the relationship between a man and a woman. He didn't say Steve should leave and cleave to Ralph. <laughs> and Mary and Susie should get together because he recognized that there is no multiplication. There is no advancement of the race, the human race, with Larry and Steve. They, they can't produce nothing. He said, be fruitful and that's what he said. There's no multiplication with Ellen and Sue Ellen. They can't multiply a thing. But now that is, that's normative. And listen, if we don't stand up and push back, same-sex marriage is going to be legal in America. Oh, yeah. It's going to happen. And it will happen because Christians have, would have been playing PC as opposed to playing BC. Mm -hmm. Well, you can count on this pastor to stand up and say it's wrong. Thank you. I will do it. <laughs> Antonio Grimsey said this, we're going to destroy the West by destroying its culture through infiltration. Men and women, it's not an accident that much of what I'm talking to you today about is not being broadcast or communicated through the fourth estate. I mean, you know what the fourth estate in America is. It's media. We have the executive branch, House of Congress, and the judiciary. And the fathers made sure that the fourth estate would not be controlled by the government. Guaranteed where? First Amendment. In the First Amendment. Right? Freedom of speech, freedom of press. The press had the responsibility to keep their eye on the government to make sure that they would be consistent with the principles that undergird who we are. And when they would go off track, they would report it, and the people would rally and push the government back into place. That's not the case today. Mm -hmm. David Rockefeller said this at his retirement. He said, first of all, I want to thank all of you in the media, for we would not have been able to do what we were doing if you would have shined the light of day on who we are and what we were attempting to do. Did you know he said that? Yeah. It's right there. You can go on the internet and look at it, pull it up. He said that. He thanked them. <laughs> How, why did he thank them? Because he bought them. Men and women, there is an ugly, dirty plot that is being perpetrated on America today, and it's not from without, it is from within. The power brokers, the money changers in America are running the day, and they have bought Washington, D.C., and they're moving with the absolute intent to produce one world government. Oh, here he is with that conspiracy stuff. Go read David Rockefeller's biography. 
He said this, you have heard that we have said that we are going to produce one world government. He says, you are right, and we will do it. You're not paying attention. Now, I'm reading this stuff. I'm a pastor in the inner city. I'm not a big shot and a big intellectual. I'm a brother that's down there saying, what in the world are they doing to the black community? Don't they see what they're doing? They're using poor people as a hammer to beat and destroy the system. And I see it, and I know what it is. It's communism. The lumpet proletariat. Remember that? How they would take and organize the lumpet proletariat and use it against the system? And that's precisely what they're doing with African Americans in America today. They're exploiting us and using us as a hammer against the system. I see it. And I'm here to tell you, there is something we can do. We don't have to sit quietly and allow this to happen. Saul Linsky said this, you want to organize for power. That's what he said in Rules for Radicals. That the revolutionary goal is to mobilize the poor and the oppressed as a battering rod to bring down the system. Men and women, is that not what we're seeing right now? Amen. That's precisely what we're seeing. And I'm telling you, the Father and Fathers knew that. <laughs> and the intellectuals of that day understood that. I think it was Alexander Tylett who said this. You tell me if I'm getting too long. He said this. A democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse from the public treasury. And from that moment on, the majority will always vote for candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that democracy will always collapse over loose fiscal policy. That's where we are. Always followed by a dictator. That's historically proven. Men and women, we're looking at the possibility of a dictator. We're one crisis away where he will exercise the executive privilege to terminate the Constitution. And when they stop following the Constitution, men and women, it will not come back. Do you hear me? That's the urgency of the moment. And everything, if you look at for the last two presidents, three presidents, have been setting up for a dictator mm -hmm. through executive orders. The one that you are perhaps more aware of than most is NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, that violates the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh amendments to the Constitution. If you know what that is, you know precisely how serious this is. For they have what is called indefinite detention inside NDAA which, by the way, is completely and totally unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. But yet the Senate and the House signed off on it, sent it up to Barack Obama, who signed it into law in the dead of night with no light from media on it. And now it is the law of the land for them to arrest you if they think you are a terrorist, if they just think. Well, they were at that meeting where Pastor Broden was speaking, and he's a terrorist, so they must be terrorists too. I think they might be, and they can snatch you up. Never tell your wife, never tell your children, your employer, anybody, and hold you indefinitely. They won't see you again for another three or four years if they let you go. Because we think he might be a terrorist. That's on the books right now. On the books right now is a thing called National Preparedness Act. How many of you heard of that? Where the President of the United States can take control of the economy in times of emergency and dictate to industry what they should be producing or not producing. Did you know that's on the books? We're one crisis away. Oh, this, this, boy, this man is just hyperbolized. He's trying to scare us. Okay, Google it. <laughs> Google it. I call it the Hegelian dialectic. Create a problem, control the reaction, and offer a solution. 
Theses, antitheses, this is what they're talking about. Theses is what is. Antithesis is what we want. And what happens is that we compromise and it's called a synthesis. And the compromise means that what you had in the theses is no longer in its full or and potency because it's been compromised by the antitheses and synthesized into what we have today. We're so far away from the original intent, it is absolutely sickening. So, you may be sitting there and say, okay, well, tell us why you can create the constitutional defenders. That's just a part of the reason why I did that. Second reason why I did it is called rationing health care will prey on elderly and the disabled. Sarah Palin and I, back in 2009 and 10, we both, I went on Fox and Friends, and Sarah Palin got, was announced all over the country that Obamacare has death panels in it. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And they ridiculed her, they laughed at her, called her names. They called me a, a, a lunatic out on the fringe. I remember sitting on Fox and Friend and the, the little blonde head girl, I don't know her name, sits in the middle of the two guys. And I was saying that inside Obamacare is uh, our death panels or end of life counseling. She said, Pastor Bro, are you saying that our is trying to kill off our old folks? I don't know if you saw that. But she, I mean, that was a question. If you were not ready for that question, you'd have probably uh, uh, stumbled through. But I said, I said, uh, whatever your name is. I forgot her name. Gretchen. Who? Gretchen. Gretchen. That's right. Gretchen. Carlson. Gretchen. That's right. Carlson. And I said, Gretchen, what, what I'm saying is this, that inside Obamacare, our end-of-life counseling based upon Listen, economic viability. And that what we have in America right now is that over 10,000 baby boomers a day are retiring. Did you know that? I'm a baby boomer, right? And they're retiring, and the retirees are demanding more of the Medicaid, Medicare. We get sick a little longer than most. We have more aches and pains than most folk, don't we? Most of y'all in here, baby boomers, come on and talk to me. <laughs> you know you got aches and pain. I seen you walking, coming in. Here. <laughs> right? Our gait has changed. And listen, and what they have done, March 2012, they impaneled 15 people to be on what is called the IPAB, the Independent Panel Advisory Board. How many of you heard of that? appointed by some no-name somebody somewhere who put them on that board, and they now become the bureaucrats who determine who gets Medicaid and Medicare. Here's what you need to know. Not one of them is a Christian. You think that's accidental? So they'll look at my grandmother or look at you or me and say, economic viability, who gets Medicaid or Medicare or Social Security, you at 85 or the young man at 35. Well, we're going to give it to the 35-year-old, and we're going to tell you what Barack Obama said last year. You old elderly people, you need to take an aspirin and go to the back of the line. How many of you know he said that? Yeah. I'm glad I have some witnesses in here. He said that. And when he said that, that should have been a clue to us that we don't need to reelect this guy. But we did anyway, didn't we? I know everybody said, I didn't, I didn't, no, I didn't. <laughs> Nobody did. Nobody's did. But he's back. Like Freddy Cougar. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Listen to what they're saying about us. Government led rationing of health care inevitably invokes utili uh, utilitarian criteria which cuts against the sick and the dying. When couched in purely economic terms, the elderly and the handicapped and the terminally ill are resource hogs. Resource hogs. Whose youthful life is over and is now costing more to maintain than they produce. They are takers, they are not makers. This is the language 
of atheist. This is the language of a Darwinist who believes in the survival of the fittest and natural selection. That's why there's no Christians on that board. Because Christians know that there's, there's life and value in the life because we're made in the image of God. Theologians call it the imago Dei, the image of God. Worth and value is because God created us. Somebody say amen. amen. Not because I got money or don't have enough money or I'm demanding to get money out of something I put money in. All these so-called resource hogs and, and makers, and I mean takers instead of makers, they fueled those programs with their taxes. And now they're calling us resource hogs. That's serious business, men and women. Because most of you in here are the targets. You are in the crosshairs of an atheistic, secularistic government that does not believe that God has a role in dictating anything in the public square. Hello? That's what we have right now. <clears throat> a commentator who observes our government said something that I thought is profound, and I want to share it with you, because I know i got plenty of time. <laughs> plenty of time. I want to share it with you because I think you need to hear this because I think it gives an explanation as to what we're facing and why it is that this government that we're witnessing right now is moving in the way that it is moving. I sort of hinted to it, but let me just sort of give it to you straight face. Uh, Citizen Link, which is a, a, uh, a blog, uh, produced an interview with Bruce Hasek, who is a lawyer and an advocate for life. He is a judicial analyst and analyzes what's happening legally in America. He said this as a result of a question. The question is, what are the implications of what's going on in America towards our religious liberties? Here's how you answer. I would preface my answer by saying, that the increasingly liberal and oftentimes blatantly anti-Christian worldview creeping into all levels of government is more and more at odds with the Judeo-Christian morality, which forms the basis of our constitutional guarantee of religious freedom. That religious freedom set forth by the First Amendment and many of our federal and state laws protect all religions and tells the government that it cannot establish its own state of religion, nor interfere with the exercise of religion by its citizens. But when liberal and secular worldviews get reflected in legislation or government edicts at the federal and state and local level, we end up with a whole host of laws that are prioritized and promote behavior at odds with the country's founding morality. Men and women, more and more of our legislators and the bureaucrats who are running these programs and different agencies are anti-God. And they're working deliberately to negate and marginalize the Judeo-Christian ethic in America. That's what you are witnessing today. Glenn Beck just reported on his show, the day before yesterday, that DHA, Department of Homeland Security, police officers and the military had a meeting at the Pentagon. I mean, you heard of that. And they were saying, the number one terrorist group that we need to look out for in America are evangelical Christians. When they were called on it, they said, well, well, you know, we were just, you know, that's just one guy's opinion. All those police officers, everyone with DHS, is saying that Christians are the ones that we need to be most concerned about in the face of Al-Qaeda and CARE, which is the, the underground hiding place for the brotherhood, but they're looking at Christians. I submit to you that's not accidental or incidental. 
That is deliberate, men and women. And here we are as a tea party. Well, we shouldn't talk about religious things. You're crazy. You know that the federal government is buying bullets. Yeah. Yeah. Janet Napolitano, why are you buying all these bullets? Oh, just for practice. Yes. Practice for what? Do you need all that for practice? And by the way, why are you buying bullets when we had a sequester? <laughs> Barack Obama signed an executive order that federalized the local police. Did you know that? Yes, he did. Police consolidation, the end of local control of the police force. I'm telling you, this stuff is coming at us like a tsunami. And they're setting up for something. What are they setting up for? Well, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. And I know many of us in here are preppers. There's some preppers, and you don't have to raise your hand. It's all, you'll be on camera, and they'll know who you are. <laughs> we're storing water. We're buying guns. We're putting food in our house. We're getting solar panels. We're getting ourselves prepared. And we are standing like Charles and Heston and taking my guns out of my cold, dead hands. Well, let me tell you something. That they are now giving to our local police force drones and they will not send the police to your house because they know you got your food and your guns. They'll send a drone. And the drone will come and it'll park out in front of your house. <laughs> and they'll get its target together and say, <laughs> and all your preparation means nothing. Instead of giving up <clears throat> on controlling your elected officials like you should be, and retreating to your house to store some beans and rice. And you should be. The Bible says when, when a wise men see trouble coming, he prepares. We need to prepare. But don't retreat out of the public square. Stay in the public square and let your voice be heard. Amen. Too many of the preppers are saying, Pastor Broden, I'm tired of talking. I'm running and I'm hiding. You don't need to run and hide. You need to get back in the fray. Amen. Yeah. May I remind you, as Christians, the Bible says, I didn't give you a spirit of fear, fear, but a power and a sound mind. You see, too many of us are saying we're Christians, but we don't have enough of the Bible in us to know that God has given us the ability to do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. All things are possible for them who what? Believe. 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 And our founding fathers believed that they could throw off the greatest military power in the world with a ragtag group of patriots with a few muskets. Amen. And they did it. <coughs> and they did it because they could believe. That's why we're seeing the beefing up of police force around the country. DSA is spending money to give them bullets, guns, military guns, high-powered weapons, and military vehicles. Did you know that? You know that? And do you know that that's unconstitutional? Federal government has no right to go in and control our police force. None whatsoever. That's a state's right. But because everybody needs money and their budgets are short, they'll take it money. Just like a dope man. Dope man shows up in the community, he gives dope out free. Here, man, have try some of this. Try some of this. You try some. Everybody try some. It's free. And everybody get hooked on the dope. Then they come back to him again. They say, can I have some more of that free dose? It's not free this time, buddy. You're going to have to pay for it. And that's what the H, the Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano is doing. She's doing the bait and switch. And most of us are not paying attention. We just sort of hear about it and they say, oh, well, you know, I'm trusting Pete Sessions to help us. <laughs> John Boehner's got this. Oh, Lindsey Graham is my man. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? In 2009, Janet Napolitano released uh, a, what is called the Intelligent Analysis. How many of you heard of the Intelligent Analysis? And in the intelligent analysis, she identifies who the terrorists are in America. First on her list were returning veterans from military conflict. 
Second on the list were Christians who would stand up and resist abortionists. I mean, you know that she said that. And I went to the pro-life community. I, my involvement in politics started in the pro-life movement back in 1980 and 83. I've been fighting for babies ever since. All right? Amen. And when you start fighting for babies, you get to realize it's not babies that are in trouble. It's my grandmother and my grandfather. Yeah. Euthanasia. Right? Here's what she said. Right-wing extremists in the United States can be broadly divided into two groups. Movement and adherents that are primarily hate-oriented based on hated uh, or hatred of particular religious, racial, or ethnic groups and those that are mainly anti-government, rejecting federal authority in favor of state or local authority, or rejecting government authority entirely. It may include groups and individuals like, uh, individuals that are dedicated to a single issue such as opposition to abortion and opposition to immigration laws. Sounds like every one of you in here, doesn't it? How many of you for limited government? You're a terrorist. <laughs> That's what Janet Powell Thomas said. Men and women, this Hegelian dialectic is, is been modified by Antonio Grimsey. Antonio Grimsey says that our best result, wrap it up. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even got to my... <laughs> okay. Uh, should I wrap it up, folks? No. All right. I mean, tell the people who organize this thing that you don't want me to go, because if you don't, I got to go. I got to stop. Okay. I, I, one more point. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got the mic. <laughs> I just want to share you this, this thing with the Second Amendment. Men and women, this is dangerous. Has Barack Obama gotten everything he wanted? So far he has. And he wants to regulate gun, guns in America. I believe he's going to get it. Isn't it Senator Toole and Colburn are working with him now to come up with a compromise to regulate our guns? The first step in regulation is to take them. The next step is to take them. Listen to what Sarah Brady said. You know the Brady Act? He put, here's what she said, quote, our task of creating a socialist America can only succeed when those who are, who resist us have been totally disarmed. Disarmed. She said that. And she didn't say that hiding behind the couch. She stood up in the public square and said it. And most Americans didn't pay attention. They've been coming after our guns for a long time. Uh, and if I had time, I would quote to you the guy who started the movement back in, seven, in, in 1970-something. And he says, this is what we do, incrementally and gradually. Put in a few regulations here and a few regulations here, and before you know it, Americans will become used to not having guns. They know what they're doing is that we don't know what we should do. And to bring this to a conclusion, Matthew Spaulding, in his book, titled, We Still Hold These Truths, says this, Our revolution was about the idea upon which a new nation was to be established. Permanent truths applicable to all men at all times. As Abraham Lincoln later said and proclaimed, that principles rather than will would be the ultimate grounds of government. But right now, it's the will of a few men imposing themselves upon the, and superimposing themselves <coughs> over the permanent principles that undergird who we are as a people. Most of us, after 2008, stood up and said, we want the founding principles again. What are they? Let me list 10. Liberty, equality, natural rights, consent of the governed, religious freedom, private property, the rule of law. Constitutionalism, self-government, and independence. 
men and women, those are the principles that makes this nation great. And all of them are undergirded by the Judeo-Christian ethic. Spalding goes on to say this, our nation's founders knew that the perpetuation of liberty would always depend on spirited citizens and patriotic statesmen actively engaged in the democratic task of governing themselves, holding to the spirit of 1776. Let me ask you, what was that spirit? It was a spirit of resistance, a spirit of rebellion, and a spirit of revolution. Where is that spirit today? Where is that spirit today? If we're going to win, we have got to embrace the spirit of 1776. It was Mark Levin who said in the book Liberty and Tyranny, in the introduction, he said this, I read it when I was running for office and it just brought goosebumps on me. He said the remedy to tyranny is conservatism precisely because its principles are the founding principles. He stood in the public square and through his book pointed Americans back to the starting of our nation in 1776. Founding principles that launched this nation into becoming one of the greatest nations on this planet. And if liberty dies in America, it dies in the globe. And tyranny will reign. That's the urgency of the moment, ladies and gentlemen. That's why you ought to be engaged. That's why you ought to stand now. And with that same spirit, push back against the tsunami that is headed our way. Erect walls of liberty breakers that would cause them to stumble and fall. David stood on the hillside and listened to Goliath and asked the question, who is this Philistine dog that taunts the army of the living God? And he picked up five smooth stones, F-A-I-T-H, and he tossed one and he knocked down a giant. Men and women, that's the story of America. We stood up and we knocked down the giant and birthed into existence the greatest nation ever. And here we are facing a giant again, the giant of communism and Darwinism and anti-God, hatred, from men and women who are standing in the public square and influencing our children to believe a lie. We must stand as David stood and resist and fight with the spirit of 1776. Men and women, this is our moment. We must rise. If we don't, we will lose.